Uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> yeah. The obligatory, can, can everyone hear me? <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking and laughing before everyone came in. We could hear you then too. <laughs> oh, oh, that's right. Nothing changed. <laughs> because all these people have joined us, no, nothing has changed. Am I a cat? Is there... <laughs> I laughed so I have to say I laughed so hard a couple of times with that cat lawyer video um, but anyway so thank you we can talk about that too I would love to talk about that like and watch it <laughs> so um, thank you Kristen and Nathan and um, Roman Susan what a, um, what a thing that you have been building in Rogers Park for all these years, I think this is the eighth year, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, when I, I live in, in Edgewater, so I'm near the gallery and I've been watching this gallery, you know, these shows and this, this kind of mecca of um, interesting art happen right there, right there. It makes me feel happy for my neighborhood and for um, Chicago. I have to say, and oh, and, and congratulations. I think you just were part of that grant for nonprofit artist run spaces. Go Chicago, that is huge. And so if, any, if I don't know, what's it called even? Uh, it is called the Hyde Park Art Center Artists Run Chicago Fund. And if anyone on this call <laughs> runs an artist run space, there's uh, another round of it and they're going to award 20 more grants so just I don't know go to the Hyde Park Art Center page or something <laughs> yeah it's so good I mean it's like Chicago is so cool and it makes me proud to be a Chicago artist because you know we have this first it was like the apartment galleries and that whole um, culture that grew up and it's just so cool um, because what the hell are we doing as artists like if we're not just kind of running it or going renegade or um or and also collaborating you know with like bigger places too it's just it's just really cool it's exciting okay so um thanks everybody for being here and for coming it's so weird to do this on zoom but whatever um so i'm gonna just tell you about the the surveilling snow lily project and mostly i just want to um answer questions after i share or you know, talk. I want to if we can have a conversation. But I'll tell you wh what, where this all started, and and then I'm going to share my screen and show you installation shots of the show or of the installation at Roman Susan right now. Um, so in October of 2016, when I was toying around and I discovered webcams and um, zoo, zoo webcams um, because of my elephant project. Um, where I was, you know, I found out that zoos actually have webcams that show you can watch that the animals in captivity go insane. You get to watch that if you want. If you can go to different zoos, you can, um, you know, uh, sit there and they don't hide it. They, they think that we're, I couldn't believe it when I found this webcam. <laughs> I couldn't believe that it was just right there. You could watch Snow Lily, this polar bear, she was pacing um, in the same exact spot for all day long. And so I started photographing my, my screen. And I, this was again in 2016. And I was um, in the middle of another project, my, uh, this elephant project that I just had a book published called 30 Times a Minute. And um, so I'm, that's what got me interested in how animals in captivity um, lose their mind. Just Google the word zoocosis and you will find out what I'm talking about, which I will talk about that more. But um, okay, so I was goofing around with this, uh, with this webcam and then, um, and I was recording it and I thought, well, this is really interesting and surveillance and that they, the zoo implicates themselves and that we get to just see this and what does it mean? And, and that the image itself was so fascinating because it was such a, a low res quality image. Um, and then, uh, you know, we thought Hillary Clinton was going to be the president. Like, remember that <laughs> in October? And then when November 4th, 3rd, what was it, November 4th? When 
she didn't win. I had been just goofing around again with this webcam. I um, was so shocked, like everyone, I was so shocked. I couldn't believe what happened. And then I kept recording Snow Lily. Um, I decided to do screen recordings. I learned, you know, oh, okay, I can, I don't have to, I was literally filming my screen with a separate camera to, it was, it was like evidence of Snow Lily who was pacing every day at the zoo. And then Hillary didn't win. And then I kept going because I was so enraged with the dismantling of protections to the environment. Like remember in the beginning when just like everything got dismantled right away by the, you know what, administration. And so then I thought, well, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna record this polar bear um, for, for three months. <laughs> you know, that's, I was so innocently, I was like, I'm gonna do this and I'm going to um, prove how zoos and captivity are not a solution to um, ice melt. So I researched the um, NOAA, they have this ice melt map and you can, um, met, they have create this map to, um, I'm gonna have to change this. They create this map to show the, the ice melt extent every year. And so I was really into the danger of um, habitat loss for polar bears. And so I thought, well, this is evidence. I'm collecting this evidence. It became a question about ice and a cautionary tale that captivity, taking polar bears and putting them in a zoo to save the, that species is not a good idea. It's, and that's what I wanted to show with this, with this project is that if you put them in uh, an enclosure, the, any uh, um, polar bear enclosure is one millionth it's the, the, not it, uh, their, their wandering capacity, like they, they wander thousands of miles and they're, um, they're in one millionth of the enclosure size in, in, a captive, in a captive place. So I don't know, just the insanity of it. It was so insane that this was happening. And so I wanted to prove it and record it every day. And so it, again, this was 2016. And then we turned to 2017 and like, I'm recording Snow Lily pacing every day, um, just marveling that uh, that I could do this. I mean, you'll see this. Okay, the the I'll get to the. I know I'm like stumbling around because it's so. I keep looking at the screen and I can't like concentrate on what what I'm trying to say. I'm just apolog. Let me apologize. <laughs> so it's so awkward. I feel like I'm by myself in my studio talking. It's so weird. Um, but we'll get there together, that I'll explain this, that it was so freaking crazy to see that you could record, that you could see this every single day. And then I got obsessed, which is what happens to me. And like Christmas day, she's pacing and I recorded Christmas day. And then I recorded New Year's day. I mean, every and every day of that first season. And I thought, okay, well now I have these months and I have proof that we shouldn't dismantle these environmental protections because zoos are not the solution. Like there's no way that we can say that this is a solution. The real solution is um, no captivity and no breeding because they lose their minds. So, so tragic. And then I couldn't stop recording her. So now I've recorded her up until this year. So for the past four years, I've been recording Snow Lily and um, seeing her and her enclosure changes weather-wise, every day it's different, her toys are different, um, but, sh and she gets a sore leg sometimes. And so my computer, you know, I screen record her every day. And while my computer's going, I can't work. I have to think about her or I do think about her and I, maybe I'll do yoga or I'll, I don't know, go pick up my daughter. Like while she, like she's, well, she's not pacing right now because she's inside, but she's pacing all the time every day. And so I have four years worth of footage. And so I made this video. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so um, we're gonna watch this you know, on the screen, but you can, what I, what I had to figure out was how to, how to use this footage um, 
how to make a bit like I could do a conceptual video that was days and days and years forever long. I was going to rent a storefront like a couple years ago and just have people wonder what it was all about and put the projection on the window. And so that's kind of why it's so beautiful and perfect to be at Roman Susan projecting on their window because people can wonder what it is and it's it's complete. So the webcam is now turned off. Um, I can't see her anymore. I'm literally cut off from her and it's I'm kind of in withdrawal because um, I can't see her. I mean, I literally can't see her anymore and it's it really is upsetting. So um, this is, I made a, this, I stitched together all of her days. So I'll just play a second of it. Can, can you see it? Oh, actually you probably have to. Can you hear it too? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear it. when we arrived at Aunt, at Mary Antoinette's last Antoinette's last chateau, the police turned me over to the head warden who signed a paper. They left without a word, but just before leaving, surprise, the surgeon shook my handcuffed hand. The head warden asked me, what did they give you? Life. I can't believe it. But he took another. I, but he took an, another look at the police and saw it was so. Then this fifty-year-old jailer, who had seen everything and knew my own case very well, had these kinds, these kind words for me. Those bastards. They Those bastards. Okay, so um, I'm gonna plug my earphones back in. So I had, um, you can, now I'm gonna scrub through so you can see it goes for four, I have it divided into, you know, four years. So you can see like, oh, there's a ladybug that cross walks on the, the, um, the lens. There's these magical things that happened as I kept going and kept going and there's a spider. And one time the camera turned black and white it snows, the snow goes away. And um, my challenge was, what am I gonna do with all this footage? And I decided to stitch it together so that day by day by day, you can, her feet match up. She takes 26 steps each direction. Um, unless they put some obstruction, the zookeepers try to like, in her, you can see they put a Christmas tree in her path, which really pisses me off. I'm like, they're just trying to stop her from pacing, but they never can and they never will because she, has to do it. And she is, um, you know, she has nowhere to go, but to just walk and these toys move around and uh, the obstructions don't stop her. They just probably upset her. Uh, the light starts doing these magical things. You know, I'm just go, oh, and then the wind will blow the camera in different directions. So this piece is, you know, an hour long and it's a big ask to listen to, to watch the whole thing. And, but there's rewards if people do it. And again, it's like, hopefully the recording is obsessive, just as obsessive as her behavior and the stitching it together. Oh my God, what a, what a back, <laughs> like it was so hard. You know, I was like, why am I doing this? This is crazy. No one's even going to watch this. Um, I have a couple shots of the webcam. It whirled around and, and uh, this was one day where the camera shifted and I got all these people walking by. So uh, in the summer, you can see the green comes and uh, the light again changes. Uh, it, the, the camera, at about year three, the camera really shifted a lot. And then it, that became a challenge and it zooms in too. So I did all this stuff. I became an expert in watching, you know, how the camera shifted and then the pandemic hit and no one was there and how lucky, here's a dead Christmas tree um, at the bottom 
that left last it stays for a couple months you know uh the during the pandemic in the when the zoo was closed you could see uh there's a few days where the camera shifted and i could oh here so no one is there but me <laughs> with snow lily i feel like i wonder you know psychically can these animals that um you know i'm paying attention to her because um i can't help it you know this is a life of this this is her life i see it does she can she ever know and does she know that no one's no one's there she's probably a re, in a relief i've seen people like i have footage of kids throwing things you know um a snowball was thrown at her um all these things that make me want to drive oh and then the, and then the camera went psycho haywire and went pixelated which was so fun. I don't know if I'll get that back, but it went really um, abstract. So she's walking, she becomes pixelated. She'll, you'll see her here. I was like, Snow Lily, you've become a, a pixel. So um, that was kind of amazing. Okay, so anyway, now I'm cut off and Trump is no longer the president. I don't know what that means, but um, I mean, that's good news. So, so there's a lot that has been happening with the project because I had to figure out how to edit it together. What was it going to all be? You know, should it be a four channel piece? Should it be a single channel piece all woven together? And then forever doubting like that anyone's really gonna spend any time watching this, but I don't care because I just, I'm. I feel like um, I care about her and maybe by doing this, um, something can change, you know, or the paradigm can shift about what we accept as normal. That captivity is so normalized as a thing that we just go, I mean, every, people hate zoos, people love zoos. It, it shouldn't be an argument anymore. At this point in time, no far roaming animals should be in captivity, period. There is no, saving there is no i mean just i can't i'm so fatigued with even arguing about it because it's like what does it say about our society that we would subject any living she's one of so many that all the polar bears they swim in figure eights and they um pace and detroit zoo just the the bear one of them just had twins and um what's up with the bias of the Washington Post um, printing a story, hooray, the, the bears had twins. We're so used, to, we're so, we so think it's normal. Like what would happen if the, the bias was, can you believe we're still breeding captive polar bears and we're not focusing on trying to save um, the habitat instead? Um, so, so, this is the show that is at Roman Susan. What do I do? View, slideshow. So this is from far away. For those of you who aren't familiar with Roman Susan, it's this really cool small street next to the train stop at, by Loyola. It's kind of hidden, but people come from the train and pass by. And so they get to see all the shows that are at Roman Susan. And it's um, really cool to have spent time in there the past few weeks and to overhear people's responses or just the, the how many people pass by. And um, one mom was pushing her kid in a stroller and she's like, just in passing, I think she was on the phone too, because she, she's like, polar bears should be in the ice. I mean, not that we're not in the ice, but she just, I was like, rock on, tell your kid that that's what should be. It's like not, not a captive situation. Okay, so that's the um, beautiful triangle space. And this is uh, as of yesterday. And so I not only made this video, I, which is the front and center piece of the exhibit and of the installation, I made a book. Um, Again, I wanted there to be a physical layer of the project. So I made uh, these newsprint books of uh, stills of every day of her um, recordings. And those I'm hanging on the walls to um, kind of 
mirror this, the, again, this relentlessness and this obsessiveness. And then these beautiful surprises have come across with doing the installation that the projection um, film that I'm using on the front window is actually reflecting back this almost look like water to me in the space. And so that was such a lovely on the ceiling, like that's what this white stuff is, is um, the mirror. And Snow Lily actually walks, I have a video I'll show you. She walks and you can see her walking through what looks like water. She's, you know, abstracted. And then in the background, I have these outtakes. You know, this is a, a video of different shots, um, the entrance to the zoo. Um, and I'm really also interested in just trying to use the space in a way that's transparent. So zoos are like a movie set or a, a, a theater set, you know, where the illusion of, of nature is there. And um, we're not supposed to see the behind the scenes. And um, so I have, when the zookeepers come out and clean her cage, I have some footage of that. Um, and they look so tiny, like compare, it shows the scale, like Snow Lily is really huge because the people just, when I see them on the screen, I mean, because I'm so used to seeing her size, these people look miniature. It's just kind of trippy. Anyway, I love that she's carrying this hose up and that I really wanted to include in the, in this, the cords, the projector itself, the, um, I don't think I have a shot of the actual pedestal. You know, I'm not trying to hide that there's mechanics going on. I love that there's a white cord, you know, trailing across the floor and that the projection is actually um, silhouetting the cords into the, um, this, this, uh, these clips. So I, I mean, I did that on purpose. I wanted these cords to be in there because I just wanna do the opposite, I guess, of what the zoo is trying to do and just be transparent. And then these are the books that I made. I just wanted to um, share. I don't know yet what I'm gonna do with all of those, but right now they're, I'm hanging them. And then I have at night, like the camera is really noisy. So this is Snow Lily's enclosure also, but it just at night and the way that the webcam renders the, um, the darkness is just dots. So it becomes these um, beautiful abstractions of light. And so it really became this question of uh, light and you know, all of the under the layers that have come from doing the project that you know, it's about time that you know, it's four years, it's um, every day, you know, the light from morning, the light of the morning and how the sun moves through her enclosure and how the sun moves through the space at Roman Susan and these reflections that are happening. And there's all this kind of um, engagement with, with light and what that can symbolize. Um, and I do hope, I was writing this today about this and I hope that it's, it's really hard to, to look at this. Like, it's really depressing. I'm making work that is like hard and sad and um, implicating of society. And, but I don't want it to be depressing. I want it to also just maybe be a catalyst for change, but um, if it can also be hopeful because Snow Lily is the oldest polar bear in captivity. She turned 36 in December and um, She's, she, as sad and pathetic and maddening as homicidal as I feel like being going up there <laughs> to be, I still think she's a symbol of, of um, endurance and um, that she's somehow surviving. So I don't know, that's to me, I, I thought of that today. I was like, oh, it's like, she's, she's um, able to continue so maybe we should too. I don't know. I, I thought about that. Um, so the, the growing part is that I keep adding all of these pictures. And here is the last slide for the, um, of the interior of all these beautiful abstractions that happen, you know, because of the, the way that the webcam functions. And some days the, the lens is filthy and some days it's sharp. Um, and then let me last but not least share with you Um, let's see what do I have. I showed you the snow lily and this was just an example of how when I first started I was like should I do it in a, a triptych or a now it's four years. This was when I had three years 
I thought, well, you can really see like how obvious should I be? It's always these questions when you're making work, right? And then, um, oh, I wanted to show you the light of her walking. So you can see in the background, you can hardly make it out, but this is Snow Lily um, walking right here in the mirror. So I just feel like there's a spiritual component to it that, you know, by bearing witness to her situation, does it help her? Does it relieve her? Does, can we heal as a society in ways where we are blind or um, not blind, I don't want to use that word to where we won't see the injustices um, that are so normalized. I mean, she becomes a, a symbol of how we refuse to see things that are not right or not fair. I mean, why is it that minimum wage is so low and it's just normal? Like why, you know, things like, why is captivity still allowed? Why? So hopefully we can nudge by seeing, nudge forward um, and progress in what we allow to continue to happen. And, um, you know, make, make everybody can make a, a difference. This is, um, this is uh, the installation. You can see that I have this shot of the people in the background and then there's the film and the place. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, I have over here. A, oh, here, look at, she looks back. This is so fun to edit. She, she's like, I see you. I know you're looking at me. <laughs> um, you can hear the train too. Um, and then on the other side over here, I experimented with this other clip where I have just a ladybug. And I just kept repeating it over and over. You'll see me fall too, <laughs> or almost fall. It seemed like I fell harder more than what that looked like. <laughs> okay, so I don't know what did I forget to say. Um, maybe that's maybe that's enough. I mean, I'd love to hear what what um, people think or what they uh, if we could have a discussion. That would be so cool. Um, Cause I could talk forever about snow really, but I will spare you. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. Everyone can unmute themselves. And I think maybe we have a size of group that that would be okay. Uh, and we'll just see how that goes. Um, yeah, we do have a question about the, um, the soundtrack that's part of the video. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, thank you. I, I skipped that part. So my daughter, when she was 10, Elsa, she read um, Papillon, the the book by Henri Cherrier. So um, I don't know if you know this book, but it's most people probably know. He was a, a un, he was an innocent, and he was convicted and spent um, loads of time in in uh, he's French and he went to Venezuela to uh, prison, um, and then he escaped. And so Elsa is reading that when she was 10 years old, she read, so those are um, excerpts, she read three different times in the one hour long video. And the first section, she's 10, first and second section, she's 10. And then I had her read um, when she's 14. So again, like speaking to this massive amount of time, Snow Lily is still pacing. Elsa is four years older. Four years have passed and um, her voice, Elsa's voice changes. And there's so much in um, this book that is about this injustice. And um, so much is about counting too. Like Elsa's, you know, he's counting one, two, three, four, five, and how he survived. And um, it's just kind of really um, 
you know, I tried it out to have, I had her read it. And, and then when I put it with the video, I was like, oh, this is, this works. <laughs> so you can hear that if you go to the link, you can hear the readings. Um, it's kind of, a, you know, like you heard her say when she like so innocent when she's talking about him and trying to escape and, you know, he's shoving a little canister up his anus. <laughs> it's his strong box. Like she doesn't know what she's saying at 10. She didn't even, she's mispronouncing words. And to me, it's like, um, it may, I hope it makes people watch Snow Lily with a different, even a different perspective than what they might have. So that's what the reading is. And, oh, and there's also um, Inuit throat singing in the beginning and the end. So the Inuit people uh, revere polar bears as sacred and that they, it's, it's like, hopefully people can, um, I thought a lot, like, am I appropriating, if my, you know, is that appropriate to use that? And I researched this, this woman that I credit at the end, who writes a, a lot about the Inuit people. And I hope it is um, viewed as a way to honor um, the traditions and the people who we can learn from, you know, as, um, you know, Western people of, uh, who think, you know, like, Manat like, captivity is a, is a, a, a holdover from colonial thinking and from from menageries and wealth flaunting wealth and um it's really um an ancient and it's a it's an old idea that has has lasted and ha has it's time you know has should end i wanted to ask you about yeah. that a little bit colleen like there's there's something really strange and interesting going on in the like the technologies that are being forced on this animal, one of which is this captivity mode or a sort of like presentation for voyeurism in person. And then there's this additional layer that is the surveillance technology that now maybe people relate to slightly more as everyone is being surveilled willingly all the time and putting their information through these cameras and everything. And I was just, uh, I was wondering if you might talk more about that or like if you felt any shift in your own observation of zoos <laughs> as they try to become relevant by using things like webcams. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, zoos are, they do, they're trying to um, be relevant, right? Like that's, that's, and oh, let's, let's do this. And I mean, I, I think that the surveillance question is so interesting just as a, as an artist, like that the layers of seeing um, that we're, we don't see, like, if you go to the zoo, uh, people see her, right? Um, but are they really, are we really seeing anything unless we really think about it, you know, like really thinking about what, where is the where is our food coming from where who is exploited to give me what I am getting here you know like to really think to to, to see the systems that are in place um, I'm talking about like food and um, so oopsie so if you add the layer of surveillance it's removing us yet we're seeing it even more. Like if we remove ourselves from the normal way of seeing things, do we see it more? I mean, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Like that the role of surveillance makes us focus and that if, um, if we, and that, that when I'm hanging the photographs up and they're, they're level and I'm really like making sure it's straight or I'm editing one foot to the next, I'm like paying such close attention to things that I wonder if anyone would ever notice, like, will anyone notice if I'm half a frame off or if it's crooked? And so it becomes this, this gesture to speak to paying attention and that the, the surveillance is what are we paying attention to? You know, I really love that question about like, what are, what do we pay attention to anyway? And how can we shift that? Or, um, I guess I'm also honoring it, honoring that I'm paying attention and that then I ask everyone, 
I don't know, I'm not asking people to do it as well, but maybe I am. I don't know if that answers the question, but the surveillance question is so much about layers, you know, the layers of looking and that once you're removed, um, you know, do you see it more? Because we can't, you, like my friend Vanessa, she's like, your videos, I love that she said this because it, it kind of really encouraged me to keep going. <laughs> she's like, your work makes what's real more real because you pay attention to, isn't that what paying attention does too, right? We pay attention in a whole different way. So um, just that act, that care, that act of carefully putting the photo straight in a, in a gesture to honor her is what I'm doing. I don't mean to get really emotional about it, but I feel like what what can I do to help her? <laughs> I mean, we're so I'm help I'm powerless to change her situation or get other people to. I mean, the zookeepers care, they're trying, they work so hard. It's just such a misguided idea. So pass it on. <laughs> I mean, I tell my daughter's teacher, like when she was younger, I would say like, can you, they were gonna go to the zoo for a field trip. And I said, can you not, can you not go, can you go to like a, the nature center instead? So there's like these little things that every human can do. We can write to um, the zoos and tell them to stop breeding. We don't want to. We'll pay money to go if you don't have animals. <laughs> if you give it to conservation of habitat, we'll pay money anyway. And in fact, in Detroit, speaking of Detroit, the, they have like a, a thermal cam and dress up and water fixtures and the, everyone likes that. They don't care. You know, so what are we seeing? Again, it's like the surveillance of, of seeing, um, but not. Okay, so what, what, what other questions? Let's in the chat should i look excuse me uh i had a comment and then just a super quick anecdote uh just kind of serendipitous uh when i see the work uh by the way my name is ugo uh, i'm a student at saic first year grad um you know i don't want to demean the polar bear i don't want to demean snow lily but i can't think of it i can't help but think of like this animal as like a symbol of and then you mentioned time right these four years uh, the symbol of, of us of, as Americans, you know. Um, I, I became friends with a, a French woman uh, and she said that in 2016, during the elections, she wept, she cried for our country. And I can't help but think of all the whole world is, has been watching us these past four years, and especially on January 6th. That's when you really felt all the world's eyes on us. And, and I think of that as far as the voyeurism comment. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot to unpack here. And also just a crazy serendipitous story. Um, I was TAing for a class earlier today and we have these, I'm in print media and we have this one room separate from the print room. We have this big window where everyone can see us. And uh, the professor came by because we split up the class in two and the professor came by and he was showing the other half of the class where's the other working space. And I was with the other half of the class, uh, just making sure everything, everyone was okay. And I told the other half of the class, as they were watching us, he was showing the space and pointing at us. I'm like, oh, now we know what it feels like to be in a zoo. I said it out loud to the class. But that was just like five minutes, you know, four years compared to like, we really don't know what it feels like to be in a zoo. I thought it was kind of funny that I'm seeing this work in, in the same day. So yeah, uh, thank you. That, thank you, Hugo. That's really, uh, that's, it's right. It's like, uh, and, the, and the pandemic too, that um, we feel like, I've, I was projecting that before uh, all last fall. Oh, I forgot to say, mention that. So this all, this, the, I projected it, the, um, well, hold that thought. I've been projecting it on my front window because um, what prompted me was like that maybe the pandemic, people can relate to her feeling trapped 
even though if you think it through even just a little bit further, it's like, oh wait, no, we're not trapped. We have choice. We're, we're, we don't have it as bad, but we're, it's like this endless human centric, like, oh, we're like a captive, um, you know, I mean, it's a, it, a lot of people don't, don't believe that it matters. You know, that's the thing that we're kind of what, what the normalization of how, of like human centric perspectives, like that we should see, we should like, you know, what the zoos lie and say that they're educating or they're teaching the next scientists or all this, what they're teaching is us to rationalize cruelty and, and teach kids to not trust what they see as wrong you know, that to me is what we're teaching. So um, these, these parallels are really interesting to examine of like, actually, how are we trapped in our lives in, in other, in ways? Like we all can't, I think that's the identification with her is like, yeah, I get it. I would, I mean, we pace, we feel trapped and then, and then, um, but we're not really trapped. But that's what's interesting too about going by Roman Susan, like all this walking is happening. <laughs> I appreciate what you what you're saying. Hi, Colleen. Hi. Hi, my name is KG, and I actually um, wanted to ask you a question because we met outside of your house when I was photographing, like just a cool thing happening um, on your building and um, we meant, you had just mentioned that projection that you were um, exhibiting at your house. I, I'm curious what language you use when you talk about that particular piece and if that's like so directly related, if that was something um, aside or if you can mm -hmm. maybe talk a little bit about that. And maybe I can start by saying like I was walking by um, Colleen's house and I, I'm a neighbor and I didn't know that an artist lived there, certainly not a video artist, but there was this projection happening in, it was rather kind of smallish too. And I had a moment where it was also Christmas time and snowy and <clears throat> the polar bear seemed like kind of a very confusing icon at the time where I was processing it mostly as positive and relating to some sort of holiday or advertising that I, I knew what I was meant to process as positive and then yours was very different. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of talk about that project? Well I, I was I was kind of trying to just try it out like I wanted to see what it looked like what would it look like to activate my neighborhood with her like it's all kind of an act of madness that I, I'm so upset about it that I'm projecting it on my front window. Like, look at, and injecting her, no, knowing I would be injecting her over at um, Roman Susan in February. So I wanted to start here, start here, you know, start with it on my front window um, as a way to be relentless with it. That, okay, and, I was going to continue it, but then my projectors, <laughs> I need to get another projector. That's just the real thing is I need one more projector because I think like, what if somebody sees it over here and then they, that was the initial idea, but then I, it, I'm put all my focus on doing the Roman Susan installation. So maybe I will, maybe I'll still do it. Maybe I'll do it forever because you know, she deserves that or, or, it's not going away. Like she's not stopping, even though I can't see her anymore. Um, I'm thinking about doing some sort of pilgrimage. Like what would it mean? What would it do? What could I do? Who know? who can help me? Like, what can I do to, um, is it enough to be an artist? Like sharing this? It's like, what can I actually do? So that's just where I'm at right now. Like, is it helping her? Is it, is it changing anything? I mean, I'm just being super transparent, like right now that maybe, maybe I don't, I mean, I don't need to doubt the power of making work that it has some impact, right? Like there's always some impact and, and to keep going, like maybe just for me to like, just keep going forever, keep projecting this whenever I can, project it on my front window, 
I was in New York and I was in Chinatown and I saw this, um, this was like five years ago. I saw a monitor. It was just like a, a small street in Chinatown. It wasn't like um, uh, commercial at all. And um, there was a house like, you know, in this, it was kind of a, I, it wasn't typical, um, but it was, it's, it was the Lower East Side more, I guess I would call it. And they had a big monitor in the window and I, it was a video project and it was so anonymous. And I was like, what, who did, whose is that? And my intrigue to that installation, or if it's an artist, because it, it certainly was an artist, but there's no sign saying art by, it was to inject it into the space of, of everyone. So that really made an impact on me. I'm like, what is the potential of that? I don't know. I got to meet you. <laughs> right. I know. Right. And <clears throat> it's just interesting that it, the home, it, it's not a neutral thing to project on to. Mm -hmm. I, I find it super interesting that as, as you were yearning for this access, this access to this thing that you love that you put it in your window even mm -hmm. though you don't you've you like bridged that proximity to that thing yeah I and think at home and mm -hmm. I think that's a really meaningful thing it's, it's also like a really big thing to bring mm. something home huh that's... and then I think of yard shows like when I when I think about owning property, like a house and having access to a plot of land, and it happens a lot in this neighborhood in these cool ways, people put these things in their yard, they decorate their yard, sometimes it's landscaping, sometimes it's objects, sometimes it's like vignettes and like whole mm -hmm. situations. And I always think that's like this like diplomacy happening, like yeah. this like invitation or at least um, this kind of conversation with the people that walk by it but it's also a way to protect yourself and to kind of dress as friendly mm -hmm. and to put a particular face on the house too so I think mm -hmm. it does both things yeah I wonder if it it's if it if it uh, made people upset like right across the street I wonder if they were like oh that polar bear pacing again you know I wonder if they if they wondered I wonder how many people wondered um, it's un, the immeasurability of it is really intriguing to me that um, she's in the house with us. Um, my daughter would sit and she likes to sit by the radiator and like her head would be in it with, uh, so you could see us and her in it too. And that she's in with us and, and also like it got annoying to her because if she wanted to have the, didn't want it on, you know, can you not turn it on tonight? It's like, well, can I turn it on, <laughs> please? Because I don't want to not turn it on and I need to turn it on. You know, uh, I think that there's a lot there like about her w being with us. And it's also a lot of insanity. Like this project is clearly obsessive. It is like, like that I made the book. I mean, a billion pages. Uh, I mean, so much work making every single thing. And it's all like, well, I'm going to be, I'm going to be like her. I'm going to, this is what she's doing. She's every day walking every, so I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a book to show it. I'm going to hang them all up. I'm going to, you know, project it forever until we stop, until we stop this practice, you know, maybe I'll say that right now. <laughs> I'm going to do this forever until all the polar bears are no, no more breeding and they're not being rewilded. You know, we got, we've got work to do to, um, there's so many issues. Like, I don't even, I'm not an expert in any of that, but like polar bear human con hu and human con conflict that's happening. Have you heard about this? You know, like the polar bears are, they don't have their space. So they're encringing upon human populations and, a real problem same thing that with elephants in africa and in asia too hi colleen it's david um i would just say you know you're asking you're sort of doubting what the impact of this work is and i think you know think about 
where you were with your elephant work four or five years ago and the impact that that's had now. And, you know, I think that's raised a lot of awareness for elephants. So I think you, you're kind of obligated to keep, to keep going. Um, I don't know also if you saw, but at the Detroit Zoo, one of the polar bears uh, got killed yesterday by another polar bear uh, during a mating uh, attempt. Wait, which zoo? At, at Detroit. You're kidding. No, yesterday. Um, I know it's, that's, um, I wasn't really meaning to drop that bad news, but. Um, yeah. No, part, part of me, I'm just like, good, die. Yeah. All yeah. of these captive polar bears, I don't, I mean, just like euthanize them. This is, I know that's, ins- I don't know. I have no idea what the answer is. You can hear that I get really like emotional about it because I mean, which is worse? The, your life pacing or, I don't know. I don't know. But I, feel I wanted to that. just quickly comment on the question of surveillance that was brought up. And I think it's a really interesting point. You know, um, Bentham's idea of the panopticon and ensuring the functioning of authority by observation uh, is based on, you know, uh, Louis XV's menagerie, and it's based on the observation of animal bodies. And so I think that's a really important point to bring up, but your surveillance is different. You know, you're using this tool of the zoo, and I had been thinking about snow lily and other animals during the pandemic being even more alone than they usually are, Um, but you are uh, surveilling them with like a loving eye, with a caring eye. And that's something that I think matters. And that's something that's different than these sort of like impassive, um, apathetic eyes that, you know, see the animals as backdrops to buying cotton candy and hot dogs for the kids when you go to the zoo. And so I think that the type of, of looking that you're doing in four years worth of looking at snow lily, nobody has probably looked at snow lily as much as you have and as intently as, as you have. And as and with, with as much care as you have. And so I think that's something that you should, um, you know, that's something that matters. Um, it, it, it matters, that's all I wanted to say. Huh. That's really great, thanks, David. And that's, a, that's actually a great uh, thing to mention that Bentham and surveillance, like that's really an important piece. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. That's really encouraging, and it makes me cry because, like, you're right. I, I don't, I, I'm. Uh, I don't know what to do. What are we gonna do? I mean, what am I? Uh, hey, Colleen, uh-huh. we have a, a couple of questions from yeah. the chat. Um, right. And I guess I mean I think that part of it is relating to, to some to just kind of like what do we do um and what would you say are the biggest hurdles preventing the abolition of captivity at this time um and like how and like what are the hurdles that are preventing us from changing the perspective in society and maybe how that relates to, or how this project relates to the 30 times a minute project and your interest in other animals and mm-hmm. the com- maybe conversations you might've had around this with other people um, in public. Mm-hmm. And I guess in terms of people and their relationship to zoos, because I think that a lot of us have a relationship to going to zoos and experiencing the animals and maybe it like helps us realize that the animals are real thing and helps us maybe potentially theoretically um, know about where they came from and try to preserve that landscape i mean i think that like a lot of people you know it's so it's so complicated because they're mixed intentions with zoos Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I feel like that's really, um, that's the hard question is that zoos have a perfect answer to keep going with what they're doing, which is money making, um, money making. It's a, it's a money making thing. It's a power thing. And they have the answer that will, will has worked 
up until now. I mean, it is, we live in a, a society and we have been programmed to think that humans um, hold dominion, you know, from the time when we, uh, animals became our property, when we became an agrarian society, you know, as soon as that shift happened away from nomadic um, culture, and we started having something to save and something to protect, you know, we, we built a fence and we had our, our crop and we had our, our cow and then we own them. So this is a, such an ancient embedded thing that we own them. And if we go back, if we can erase that, um, I mean, we can't erase it, but to look to societies that have before that, where there's a respect, like every, I mean, to like, we're not gonna stop, you know, people aren't gonna stop using animals, right? It's not going to. Um, but to have like a more symbiosis, like give way, give, there's an extinction, mass extinction going on because of us, like look what we're doing. So I think that um, there's a bigger problem than spectating. Um, you know, spectating kind of lulls us into everything's okay. I mean, really there's a big problem and rewilding is the solution. Attenborough, he uses that word. Um, and just this paradigm shift, it's really slow. I think that's what the, the one, at a per, one person at a time thing that I'm doing with my work is just to say, hey, let's rethink this. Do I get to put anything in a cage? Like that idea is a, um, we've been programmed to think that that's okay. Like that it's a fun day out at the zoo and look at, we get, but like um, Emory University did a great study that shows that zoos actually do not educate. <laughs> like there's been studies that show people spend like three seconds or I don't remember how many seconds per, but if you Google like um, any of these studies about like stereotypic behavior and what the effect is on animals, it's so, um, we keep, there's no justification. There's no justification. So if we're a compassionate society, which we want to be compassionate, um, just society, we have to start in these places that it's kind of a low hanging fruit actually. Zoos have such a, a platform to educate people in ways that actually could be useful, you know, to, to really educate. Like instead of lie to us, they, they really are marketing masters at, at um, saying that they're happy. And then we just believe it because we want to, or we've been, it, it's like in all the kids' storybooks. So I think it's just a slow shift in thinking of what's allowed and why, how is it even allowed that we, we are holding these sentient beings in cages? How is that allowed? Like if we teach kids that, can you imagine the compassion we're gonna have in our society from that, from shifting that thinking? Like, wait, we don't, we don't allow people to be exploited. We don't allow people to be underpaid. We don't allow homelessness to happen. You know, like the, it starts with like, how is this even allowed? So. I, I think it branches out as soon as you scratch the surface of um, things like rationalizing what I think is cruelty under this, it's so suspicious. You know, like it, this, anything that would like power imbalance and these suspicious models that are so in, in place um, are, are, I don't know. I do think we're changing. I think that we're everybody, we're, you know, we're waking up. So anyway. It's a, it's a complicated question. Like, where do you start? How do you start? How do we do this? And uh, we don't allow children to be caged on the border, but we somehow manage to live every day with that happening, right? And, um, and we can be outraged, but the lack of information out there as to their daily living, right? Uh, somehow that lack of information maybe perhaps uh, pushes people to continue to ignore it, right? Yeah. Um, when, um, my name is Juan Carlos, uh, and some of the things that came to my mind, you kind of touched on a little bit. Um, uh, when this idea of how, how 
are we able to keep living each, each day with these things happening around us, right? And, um, and yes, we want to be compassionate and care and try to do things about this. But at the same time, we also question as to, uh, you know, what can we actually do that, like what you said, that can implement change, right? And there's this, um, it almost abstracts those feelings of trying to make sense of why we feel that way, right? Because, and this, what I'm talking about it, actually, I started thinking about it when you were showing the images of, um, of the, of the video reflecting from the window onto the Roman Susan gallery and everything got pixelated, right? Mm -hmm. And it's this thing where you're watching, but um, you're watching and these pixelations, almost like an abstract, um, abstract uh, representation of us trying to fathom what we've created, right? Um, not being able to make sense uh, of our culture as humans are wanting to control and I actually put it down to or call, colonize, you know, people, uh, cultures and animals, right? Um, uh, and we, this idea of um, wanting to control because uh, we're attracted to it or because we want something from it and then um, creating these spaces for them to exist in, right? That it's the same space that's been there for over <laughs> 30, 40, 50 years, nothing's changed, right? Like if you cared about this animal, you would have figure out a way to uh, actually change this environment for them if, you know, but instead their narrative is controlled, right? They use it as a, uh, 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 as a, as a tool to inform people or educate, but you know, then what, right? Cause this, uh, uh, this polar bear still encapsulated. Um, and it may, again, it goes into these topics about how I wanting to view and how we see, right? Cause I think a lot about this idea of colonization and this idea of, um, you know, of, uh, uh, forced labor and slavery, right? Uh, I think a lot about uh, one of them Bailey's uh, freak shows, right? Where you would uh, get things or create things that people weren't used to seeing and introduce them as freaks or introduce them as exoticness, right? Uh, because we wanted to control that narrative of these animals or people, right? And it, and it, and it's, and it's, and it's that, um, that curiosity that we have, right? The wanting to learn and to investigate, right? And at the same time, I think we feel the sense of, of guilt, right? At, to the fact that we know that uh, it also draws us to it, right? And it's at, it's at the um, expense of, uh, you know, this living animal, right? Because they're just pacing back and forth. And we can't fathom that notion, right? Um, uh, so their narrative is controlled. They had two. They just had two polar bears. They just had this or this and that, right? And so I think that is interesting. Um, how you control uh, the narrative, right? And how much we, you know, us ourselves, right? Like you don't see the slaughterhouses of uh, of cows. Videos of that. So you can go see how your food is being made, right? Because we can't, right? We can't grasp that, right? Um, but um, I, I, those are some of the some of the things that came up when I was watching uh, your work here, and just this idea of um, these uh, uh, of wanting to decipher how is it that we've created these. Uh, structures and embedded them in modernization that now they're they're part of every single aspect of our lives you know in so many different layers and yeah. varieties right yeah you said a lot that's really that's really like to kind of unravel like even the word curiosity like we're it's it's it, the impulse is really beautiful we're so curious you know we want to see the, the the it's it's amazing but then we 
now we're, we have to be wise and, and kind and say, okay, well, this is, cur- this is fun to see. And I have all this power. You know, it's like the, the question of power is really interesting because we, we don't, we'd be killed, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so we, we want to have that thrill, like this, this, you know, curiosity, power, and, and this, and this thrill of um, exerting of what we couldn't really do. Like, yeah. So thank you, Juan Carlos. That's a lot. Um, hey, hey, Colleen, uh, this is really amazing work. Thank you for sharing this. And I can't wait to go see the actual uh, injections and installation at the space. I, I was, and, and I, I arrived late, so I apologize if, if you've covered this uh, earlier in your talk. Um, can you talk a little bit about time? I'm watching your video and it's just mesmerizing how you've edited it. And, you're also talking about like footage over uh, four years. And I imagine that like the way you've been able to capture uh, uh, the, the polar bear pacing back and forth, I'm not necessarily looking at an actual, uh, like uh, I guess a rational sequence of time. It's just like, it, it, you're, I feel like I'm probably toggling back and forth over four years. Uh, as you're trying to like make sure that that we we see this polar bear seamlessly going back and forth this this space, I was wondering like uh, if if yeah, I just wondered to know like uh, what what are your thoughts about uh, time in this sense, uh, even in the sense of like man's like domain and what we we need to control. <laughs> That's I th- I think time is a, is kind of the. Um crux of what so it's day it's day by day the video that you're seeing is day after day after day over four years so it's in order from uh, uh 2016 up until 2021 um so i have down here like we that it's there's the component of waiting you know like th- this question like time is uh it's marking time and that time is passing, it's compressed because, you know, like we see one day where the snow is melted. So a whole day has passed or um, it's not every single day. I don't have four solid years in this video. I have, you know, there's days where I I didn't record every single day. So I wanna be clear about that, but that um, it's also endless. It's sort of hopefully seemingly endless. And um, the pacing kind of speaks to that and that and then there's also this question of absence, like she's waiting, there's not, what is she pacing for? Like, what is ever going to come? So what does she wait? Like, how much does she have to wait? How much time? So um, when will it stop enduring the endless? Is it pointless? Um, yeah, I think that with this um, asking to ignore time, uh, do we think about do we think about time passing? Do we think about time passing? Um, and that if we think about it, it makes us more acutely aware of time passing. I mean, just even this past year being in lockdown, like think about how time has shifted, the experience of time when we're home and where we can't go out really, you know, we can, but it, time is, is all freaky, isn't it? We're, we're kind of, uh, I mean, it was worse in the beginning. Now I'm more used to it, but, uh, you know, just these, uh, I was going to title it five Octobers because it's so much about this time. And that, um, to in Papillon, even he talks about, um, he's going to meet with the judge to try to get his sentence reduced. He got life in, he got life as his sentence for a murder he didn't commit. And he's telling the guy, well, or no, he's thinking aloud. He's saying, well, I'm going to go see the judge and I'm going to maybe get my sentence reduced. What, 20 years? It doesn't matter. I don't, it, time doesn't matter. So the, that's in the book too, that what is time? He just wants, he's going to escape. He's, that's his plan. He's not serving any time or he ended up serving, I think like 14 years or something. So 
Uh, thank you, Mark. I really, I don't know if that really answers it, but the fact that, um, I mean, time is such a big, I love that you bring up time. <laughs> Did that answer? Okay. Thank you for that, for the question and for the comment. Anybody else? Jump in. Oh, Christine, I happened to see this yesterday. Oh, really? <laughs> when I first saw the um, bug go by on the monitor, on the webcam, I was like, well, that as a photographer, you know, thinking about lenses and thinking about the fact that like, also speaking to time, I'll just say that like, there is a lens that is recording Snow Lily, right? And that the lens is an object that exists and that a bug walks across that lens, which is behind a glass that is dirty, which then Snow Lily exists in a place, like she exists, she's walking and that we're seeing her on our computer and through, if I'm seeing it in real time um, during the webcam, you know, playing um, through the internet, that's this other layer. And then I'm recording it and sharing it with you and then projecting it onto the screen. It's like a hundred million layers of, of lenses and of what's real and that, you know, the, the ladybug really walked across the, the um, lens and <laughs> just the objectness of it. And that um, when my, um, you know, seeing it on the street passing by my house or seeing it over there, we're seeing it, you know, how many layers away from actually Snow Lily. It's kind of to think about that she's, she's really pacing some, somewhere. So I don't know, isn't that kind of a, a, a lot to, it's a lot to think about is what I wanted to say. Did somebody else have a question? I didn't have a question about that kind mm -hmm. of like, so for many years you've been taking video and photos of animals in zoos mm -hmm. and then so you have agency in the lenses of that and how you were framing it and so forth. And so I was just curious about the emotional change of going to their point of view, the zoo's point of view. This is what they're representing it as. Previously, you documented things with your own agency. I don't know Yeah. what the shift is there. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's like, it's, fascinating because of the wind you know I don't get to operate and that when when the first time the wind shifted the webcam away like sometimes I mean I have in the video where it shifts it a little bit but sometimes it shifts it blows <laughs> and it's like filming this duck pond over here or it filmed like this tank next door I debated if I should include that you know because I find that just that's really interesting to me um, that the webcam has, it, they've lost control. And then who fixes it? Oh, and I didn't even tell you. <laughs> so I called, okay, this is kind of funny. And then maybe we should end, cause I don't know, maybe it's going on and on. But okay, a fun fact, the, <laughs> the webcam was really um, off kilter. I have, I think three days I did record it. So I called the zoo and I pretended like I was, you know, like what's wrong with the, I'm trying to watch the polar bear and I can't see it. I like, so I purposely try, tried to sound really dumb and like, I'm actually a person who would really be interested in their stupid webcam. And so I'm like, well, I can't see it. <laughs> Use the word it. So, um, the lady's like, oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll look into that. We'll find out what, <laughs> and I'm like, and then I'm like conflicted because now they're, get, they feel like supported in any way, like that someone care. <laughs> I'm like, don't, don't be supporting what they're doing, <laughs> but I need, you know, it's like this conflict, like I want it all to go away, but then, I mean, and the question of like, 
aestheticizing i mean my insta is it aestheticizing like let me ask you i won't go there but it <laughs> nathan you're like don't go there <laughs> because i think that um photography or or um am i uh, uh, there's always a risk of um making it about me and my work and i wouldn't ever want that but I felt a little bit like when I was so fascinated by the light, I'm like, Colleen, this is about snow lily. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, I mean, I think that that's sort of in the question I was asking you, you like, you've lost control and you are subject to the zoo structure for this work in a way that is closer to how this animal is being subjected to this system. Hmm. than if you have the agency to depict them in beautiful videos and photos that you'd taken previously of animals in captivity. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I mean, I think there's, yeah, there's just like, I think that that's part of the contrast that brings this, brings all of the things that we're talking about in terms of captivity and incarceration and the, the carceral parts of society i mean like all those things i think like it kind of gets wrapped like i think that like uh, allowing um this camera to sort of speak mm -hmm. for you aesthetically is kind of like helping draw out all those conversations mm -hmm. because i think like sometimes like if we watch it like if if i watch a nature documentary and i'm just enraptured by the detail and the closeness. I mean, I, I really appreciate that and it helps me really appreciate the animal, but it doesn't make me think about all these other mm -hmm. issues. And I think that mm -hmm. that's what is so rich about what you're doing and all the way you're describing it and all of the sort of like anxiety wrapped up into it as well is really like prescient mm -hmm. and that's that's been the gift i think of it like going following something through and finding those gifts as an artist like oh i didn't expect the webcam to pixelate you know like what i didn't expect uh you know to be to, like right to not have full there's a looseness that, that, that is new that I love about this, that I'm like, oh, this is teaching me and embracing, to embrace this, um, especially at the end when the camera really breaks down, it, it, like the beginning of the fourth year, it, get, it was really bright. Like this scene right now, like they got, it almost was blown out. Some of the days I couldn't use, but that, yeah, I had no control, so. Thank you for saying all that. That was, that's just a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we're gonna turn the recording off, but if you want to hang around and talk some more, we, we will, I don't, we can't speak for Colleen, but maybe Colleen will hang out with us some more too. <laughs> of, course. <laughs> of course, thank you.